This is the Obscurity to Authority podcast with your host, Darren Cabral. All right, let's do this. Let's Good. have a conversation. Good stuff. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I know you You actually uh, messaged me a couple of times and I yes. just, I, I usually like to say no, but you know what? Yeah. You're just such a charming guy. I have to say yes. <laughs> yeah, I harassed you a little bit for a little while. Um, but it was worth it. There's good reason. And the reason is, for those of you that, that don't know Pedgman, Pedgman here is kind of the reason why I got into entrepreneurship. So he has a business called Secret Entourage, which has a program called Secret Academy, which is basically a giant online academy of him interviewing entrepreneurs, real entrepreneurs, not how to make a million dollars overnight with this. It's real business owners, real entrepreneurs, libraries of endless content. And when I first started out, like a lot of people, I knew I wanted to get into business, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it sounds dumb, but a lot of people go through that. Um, and I downloaded your academy and I just started watching and watching and watching because no one in my family was in business. None of my friends were in business. I had no reference or kind of like, where do you even go? How does the world work? And I just consumed that content for six, seven months. And it's, it was like an MBA in business, which was amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that yeah, got me. Point, exactly. You know, when we originally started, we wanted to make education affordable to all that was kind of my my goal and i knew uh that it was just such an important thing to figure out a way to bring real straight to the point no fluff you know content to people not about people feeling good about sharing their stories but rather real practical uh back-to-back -back advice on different industries and different people who have had success in these industries and I wanted to bring people like a real world academy, you know, and I thought that some people would get it. Some people would not. That's fine. But at the end of the day, those that did want to get it, I felt would have a good place to go that just like you could ultimately find their uh, their way to be purposeful in life, regardless of what they chose to do. Right. And that's honestly, that's exactly why I tried so hard to get you on today, because you were a big part in, in getting me to where I am now, which is not very far. But when I first started consuming your content, um, I just left the job in plumbing. I was a plumbing apprentice for three years working Toronto housing projects, um, like terrible, like the, the environment, everything about it. And I had quit that after an injury. I fell and I was an EI. So when I found you, I was on basically it's our employment insurance, basically. So I checked from the government every two weeks because I couldn't work and uh, I was home. So for about eight months to a year and that's when I found your stuff and that's when I started consuming. And now you fast forward, that was probably three and a half, four years ago, right? We're running an agency, a marketing company that'll probably do about half a million this year. And we just started it about two years ago and everything came off that basis of what I learned from you guys in the beginning. Like that was crucial. And and the cost was not like I would have paid $10,000 for it. Right. No, I know. But that's, that's the point, right? Affordable education. And you know what, what you said is so, uh, so real. And I wish more people would hear that, that when you said, you know, it was a while ago and I'm still not that far. And I think that that's so important to understand that entrepreneurship isn't an, a two year journey. I think people, I had a guy recently that was showing his stats on Instagram and it was like, Oh, my store, you know, on Shopify did like 200 K a month. And he was like kind of bragging about yeah. that. And I was sitting there watching that and he was trying to buy a car and he doesn't have like 30 K cash to do it. <laughs> and I'm like, and so my point is that, you know, the argument wasn't that, you know, Oh my God, this guy's poor or not. The argument is that there is no need for that, right? There's yeah. no need to showcase 200K a month when we all know you're not making 200K a month. You know, you just because it's like me saying I have a company that does $300 million and someone would be like, oh my God, like that's crazy. And then it's like, yeah, but 295 million of that is inventory. And you're like, <laughs> okay, like, you know, like, well, how does that work? You know, like, why is that even a big deal? Well, it's yeah. not because then technically I have a $5 million company, but. Yeah. I think a lot of people just get excited over big numbers. And, and I think that's why it's just such a marketing strategy used by so many. But I tell people you're better off building a real half a million dollar company. You're better off building a real million dollar company than you are building a, a pretend 10 million, 15 right. million, 20 million dollar company that leaves you with no money in your pocket because yeah. reality is money talks, bullshit walks, right? Yeah. And if you're not putting money in your pocket, I don't care that you're making revenue, if the revenue is not turning into profit, then it isn't a real business. Right. It's just uh, it's just exciting looking, but it's not really tangible. What's the point of being in business if you don't have $10 to wipe your ass with? You know, I don't understand what 
that that doesn't make any sense to me. You know, like yeah. so a lot of people get excited about revenue. I get excited about, about net profit, and yeah. that's something that a lot of people don't talk about. Yeah, I, I think it was Bedros Cooley, and I don't know if you know him, but he said something. It's a very quick quote, which is basically, "Revenue feeds the ego, profit feeds the fam." Right. So <laughs> that that's really what it's all about, like that top line number. But so many people get caught into that. Um, and I see it all the time. Like for you, you look at a guy doing two million a month, and that's even like okay, but whatever. Like what's left? But I'll see guys even doing like I made two grand this month online on Shopify, and they're posting that on their stories, and it's like it's it's ridiculous. I think that there's something about this hype now of business, and just everyone's the expert. And hey, I made two grand a month, or I made even a million. Like in my mind, a million a year, even even in a high net business, is like you just kind of lost your baby teeth. Like you just kind of started. Like that's where you start at. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's got to be with profit. Cause like I know businesses just like you that are doing 1 million, 2 million, 5 million that the owners are making nothing. They're paying themselves 10 grand a year, 15 grand a year. Mm-hmm. There's nothing left. Right. So I, I tell people this all the time. It's like the, the business validation starts at a million in revenue a year. Right. But again, then, you know, that revenue is at least with a 30% margin. So right. if you're making or have a million dollar business that doesn't give you at least 300,000 yeah. in, in kind of gross profit to this idea where you can just at least say, Hey, this is real money that came in the business. Then you, you're probably either in a bad business or you just really get excited about doing business, but aren't doing good business. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, you can, we talk cars and, you know, I know you like cars yeah. and stuff, but it's like, you can own a Ferrari or you can own or have the ability to own a Ferrari. There's two completely different right. things, right? You know what I mean? Like some people have them, some people can afford them. There's a difference like between the mindset, you know, and I teach people that, which is interesting because I sometimes get caught in this place where it's not my place to decide who should or shouldn't have one. Right. You know, it's, it's up to people to decide if they should, but sometimes I yeah. look at people and I'm like, no, really, like, you're, you know, just stick to a Honda Civic or something. <laughs> nice. No, I, I totally know what you mean. Um, I see it all the time. Like, we're, we're in Toronto and there's an area north of here it's called Woodbridge and it's synonymous for you know 28 year olds driving new mclarens and, and driving these lamborghinis that like i know people driving g i know a guy who bought a gtr whose job is shoveling the snow in front of mailboxes in the winter time right mm-hmm. for, for a company by the way that's not the business and he, he figured out that the payment would be about 2800 a month i think he said and he makes 3000 a month so that it worked <laughs> so well that's the problem you know like I mean, I give those guys a lot of credit for at least trying, right? Mm. But at the same time, I, I look at people in two two categories, either people who are playing for the long run or people who are playing for the short term, right? right. If you're playing for the long term, you have a diversified strategy, even if that includes like additional spending or even maybe you bought that GTR ride and you'll never lose a dollar. Who knows? You know, like maybe. I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm a big advocate for good in spending, even if it's overspending, it's still okay. You know, bad spending uh, is yeah. a disaster, but good spending doesn't hurt, even if you don't have that much money. Yeah. So, you know, I can't say that that's a good, wise choice or not without knowing the outcome, but I can say that uh, there, there's just only really two people, people who see 10 feet in front of them and people who can take a look at where they want to be in 10 years and understand where every decision they make plays a role in that 10-year time frame. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that goes back to the first point, the whole thing with people are playing for short term. They think, honestly, even lately, entrepreneurship's become this this buzzword, this thing that's cool to do. And I, I just don't see it that way. Like to me, it's a what else would I do? And it's something that, that I enjoy. And it comes with a shit ton of struggles, especially in the beginning when you don't have money, when you don't have stuff. And I'm sure it only gets worse. But I do it for the fun of doing it. To me, it's it's the game of doing it. And if we can make a profitable business that we can live a life that's worth living and, and do the things we want and buy the cars we want, that's awesome. But I look 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, not how do I make seven figures on Shopify next month? I mean, if I could do that, I would, but I can't. Well, you know, I, I think if you want to change that in the world, you got to stop uh, labeling people as entrepreneurs. And I, I talk about that a lot in my book, Third Circle. But the mm. point of that is that I think the earlier we drop this name entrepreneur from people who just own businesses and call them business owners. Right. The, the faster we take away the sexiness of truly trying to create social change, create an impact through entrepreneurship and so on and so forth, and really show people that being a business owner isn't sexy. It's, there's a reality to it that it can be rewarding, of course. You know, nobody that's been in business 20 years will say, Oh my God, I can't wait to go back to work for someone else because <laughs> I made it. But, but I can promise you that 90, probably 8% of the, 
business owner community on entrepreneurs. They're just business owners. And many of them are very successful. Don't get me wrong. They could be millions of dollars in, in profit, you know, right. in the bank. And it still wouldn't make them entrepreneurs. And I think so often we get, we confuse the two so much that it becomes so easy to just put everybody in this one bucket and then say, well, oh yeah, everybody is the next Bezos. Everybody's the next, mm. you know, like, uh, Musk and this and that, or they want to be anyways, and they're working towards it. But then you ask, well, what do you do? Uh, I own a cleaning company or I own a restaurant. And it's like, yo, bro, there's no correlation between entrepreneurship and owning a restaurant. And I think people just don't understand that. So that's why it, it's just exciting because it's been a, so that's what, when you tell someone you're an entrepreneur, the first thing they go in their mind is like, oh my God, like I've seen an entrepreneur on TV it was Bezos. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> How many of us like sitting around like two hundred billion dollars, being like, "Yo, like this is what we do." And that, like it's like that doesn't even make sense anymore. Yeah. You know, like shit is like so gone that it's like it, it just doesn't. I like and you know I give up. Like meaning like just I have nothing to say on that. No, I, I that's a great point. But so in your mind, what separates? What makes an entrepreneur an entrepreneur if if revenue and numbers aside? Well, I don't think it has anything to do with, uh, I don't think it has anything to do with numbers at all. I think it has to do with the ability to create social impacts and social change. And I think the vehicle to do that is business. So, you know, a lot of people misunderstand and even confuse entrepreneurship with charity based businesses. They're like, Oh, if this business has a charity component like Zappos, for example, then it's automatically entrepreneurship because they're changing the way uh, people get shoes in these bad countries. You know, right. I'm not saying there isn't an entrepreneurial component to Zappos, but at the end of the day, uh, the core concept of it is a shoe store, right? And when we look at entrepreneurship in the sense of like what Tesla has attempted to do, I think I, I'm actually an anti-Tesla fan when it comes to their cars. I think their cars are complete horseshit vacuum yeah. cleaners. But uh, <laughs> that's my that's my opinion. Yeah. You know, I'm sure many people will disagree and love yeah. their cars, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what they've done that's surprisingly amazing is they've completely rewired uh, how dealerships do business. Yeah. And they've completely deleted what a dealer network is, which is freaking unbelievable. And that part most people won't even understand or know. Yeah. Uh, the other part that they've really engineered above and beyond is they've allowed the market to adopt an electric car uh, as a whole versus just as a part of a company or a component of a company. Like it's like saying like our entire brand is electric and you're just going to love it versus, okay, one of our 15 cars is electric and right. this is what it is. And they've done a job good enough where they sell out of future cars and they get like an audience to back kind of their thought. And they've also fast forwarded the electrical kind of revolution around the ability for other manufacturers to adopt electric faster, you know, with charging stations, places and making it streamlined across the US. So they've brought ultimately the, the cool factor into the electric that was always missing, right? So like, and they innovated that industry pushing social change forward. So if you're Musk and you say, well, I want climate change, you go to people and you say, hey, uh, give me a million dollars for climate change. They're like, oh yeah, I'm not buying into that. But if you're someone and you go and say, hey, listen, give me 200000 for this car, for this vacuum cleaner, I should say, and somehow that is going to now help climate, you know, someone is like, I can understand that and I get something cool out of it. So it's it's promoting social change through business, which is the ideal uh, concept of what entrepreneurship is. I mean, if you look at his past companies, too, you can see the mindset continuing, even with the PayPal effect. And the idea behind bringing online transactions and streamlining the ability to take transactions uh, online. So when I look at all these things, I, I say, OK, that's a good example of entrepreneurship. you know. And then I look at someone else who might make $20 million with 14 different restaurants in the hottest part of town. And that's OK. There's nothing wrong with them. And congratulations you know, for being in that business. But I don't think owning the restaurant in itself makes that person an entrepreneur, even if the concept in the restaurant is fabulous and beautiful you know and, and really like award-winning which is fine you know yeah no that, that's a that's a great point i mean there, there is a difference between being an operator a business owner and an entrepreneur and i think there has to be that that boundary are you creating social change are you bringing impact for others for the greater good are you moving something forward or are you just making money are you just operating and i think that's important because now it's getting a little like real estate agents will call themselves just in general what do you do i'm an entrepreneur 
I have I know mortgage agent friends who they go I'm an, their bio on Instagram says entrepreneur, their mortgage agent. And again, nothing wrong with that. They could be stellar mortgage agents doing a great thing, but it's not the same thing. Like I don't consider myself necessarily an entrepreneur. I want to be. I strive to be. Um, that's why we're changing the agency model now and trying to get into an academy that we can launch out and do training in a different way and reach different people and, and trying to get there, but I'm not there yet. Um, but that that's the goal, and that's why I'm trying to talk to and, people. But that's too. okay, right? Because there's yeah. such a fine line between the two. Like entrepreneurship uses business as a medium to connect people, right? right. Like and to connect a, a cause to something that people understand through a monetary value. In the same way that, you know, a business can soon – operate for a long time and then or in just five months suddenly choose to become entrepreneurial because they identify a new way to do something within an industry and say, okay, we started as a mortgage office, but right. now I can really see this void in not in just the marketplace, but void in the way we do mortgages. And I'm going to implement these other strategies yeah. to not just bring on more clients, but ease how people go into homes, you know, and as a result, helping the the chain management of how that that entire industry works. And that could have just started as a real estate office or just as a realtor in an office that then got his you know mortgage broker license. So all I'm saying is it's not it, it doesn't have to be a one to one. You wake up, you choose to be an entrepreneur, you're it, you know, and then you don't only work on life changing things and you're the mother to reach the money, you know, exactly. It, it's, it can be a progressive journey. And that's why I like the beginning of this when you said, hey, look, it's been three years. Well, you know, we're on our way to a half a million dollar company. And I think that's a, a big deal because that's the reality of business. It's yeah. not a zero to 10 million in two years. You know, I, I have a good friend of mine who built a supplement company and he went to like $30 million in, in three years. And people are like, oh, my God, that's amazing. And that's spectacular. I agree. But what they don't see is that he had another supplement company before that for 10 years. So of course he went three years, 30 million. So I'm not saying that it's not, it's taking away the credit. What I'm saying is that people don't look into context, right? right? They, and because of the lack of context, they, they set benchmarks and compare themselves to people that just don't understand, you know? Yeah. No, I, I 100% agree. And that, that I, like, I struggled with that too, but your academy actually helped me get through that a long time ago. When I started to see what real entrepreneurship was and their stories and how long it could take, and what it really was, that set the bar where, hey, it's not just about what I'm seeing on Instagram. There is a reality here. It's going to take longer. It, it is a ride, right? And the reality, like, honestly, the reality is if you start like me and a lot of people with no information, no knowledge, no network, sometimes it just takes years to build that. And you just need that to go forward, right? Yeah. You don't have it. So anyway, that's in my books, you know, the negative yeah. 100 to zero line, you know, like getting to the yes. starting line in itself is part of the journey. And people are like, I want to be an entrepreneur, so I'm going to start. I need a loan. And it's like, well, go get a job. They're like, why would I get a job? That's counterproductive. And I'm like, you have no money. Get a job. Like, go get something and get to the starting line. Yeah, exactly. And I want to talk about that because you do have a book. You have a great book. Um, so not only was your academy the first business program I ever bought, one of many since then, your book was the first business book I ever read on Audible, which was the download. That's how I actually started on Audible, like 200 books later. Uh, that was the first book. So let's talk about that. What is Third Circle Theory? That was a, a system I put together when I looked back at my life one day and I said, what is it that allows me to just always push forward, never see any type of restrictions in my life for things that prevent me from being able to get to a goal? How can I set destinations so fast yet people struggle to even set one? You know, uh, all of these things that have made me me, I kind of started trying to relate to my past background. And since I had interviewed so many people, I had so many friends that were successful in their space, it helped me kind of connect the psychological dot of like what happens in the mind at different phases. And so uh, the third circle theory was really my contribution to society, trying to help people understand the evolution of the mind as it pertains going from a state of loss, meaning everybody like starts loss uh, in a sense because they are the byproduct of their family circumstance you know we're all born in different circumstances with different money baselines countries and everything so we don't really have a choice as to how we're born or where we're born but so the every single human struggles with the idea of mastering circumstance which is the first circle and then every human then has to enter society which is the mastery of society which is the second circle and then ultimately every human at some point or another may choose to pursue uh, or ask themselves this live question, like, why am I here? What is my purpose? What are some of these uh, reasons why I exist? And I think too many people 
aren't asking these questions and those that are are looking for uh, a lot of times religion to to justify things like that yeah. and try to justify like being a good human being rather than unlocking potential and understanding that every human can be purposeful uh and as a result of that purpose uh driven mentality can eventually commit that purpose to a greater cause and i think people just wait around thinking oh well someone's going to give me my purpose or i'm going to have a moment where i fall and i'm going to open my eyes and there's going to be this thing in front of me and i'm going to know i want to devote the next 40 years of my life to helping like giraffes in africa and i'm like oh shit you're waiting around hoping that you fall down one day and open your eyes to reality you know and yeah. instead i thought to myself and i was like well if we teach people how to live uh, a life of purpose where they can find purpose at any given time and moment in what they do, then perhaps we can teach people uh, in essence to be ready to commit to a greater purpose than themselves. And so the idea was that it started as or it was marketed ultimately as a business book to begin with because it was maybe ahead of its time mentally. Mm -hmm. So some people weren't necessarily ready for the psychology of purpose and all these things. But I think as uh, just the world moves to become more spiritually aware or so I want to call it and be more internally aware of their potential, I think it's a necessary book because it, it helps people connect the dots on a lot of the things that perhaps they, they, they see and talk about, uh, like confidence, they, they think about emotions, uh, they think about love, their friends and everything. And they, there's different books on different topics, like how to make friends and win influence and all that crap. But but this book is more about understanding the, the psychology of why a, a human being does what they do and where they stand on the map. So ultimately, like a modern uh, version of a hierarchy of needs kind of uh, setup, but in a way that's very understandable by all. And it's it's ahead of its time, but it's also a progressive book, which means it will stand for something different for each person that reads it, even if they read it 10, 15 times. So when you reading the book will be something. My other buddy uh, who's built a $100 million company reading the book will feel different about it. And my other buddy who's 90, who's maybe helped, you know, like cure diseases will still, you know, think of it very differently as well. And that's the idea of the book is that it can relate to everybody but it holds a different meaning to each based on where you are in life. Wow. Yeah, I honestly, I as you say that, I'm thinking I have friends and and even relationships with, you know, like my girlfriend for example, where we talk about this where maybe she hasn't found her purpose yet. And I start to think like when did it click for me? And as you're talking, I'm like, shit, it was when I read that that book. Like that's what kind of gave me the understanding of these stages that I'm going to move through. And, and the normality of it and, and removing the fear and the uncertainty of it and knowing that there is actually a path and stages I, I move through. That's powerful. That kind of just took me for a second. No, that, I mean, this is a book I think that everybody has to read. Well, where can they get it, every, by the way? Every human being. doesn't matter what your age. I mean, 17, 14, yeah, yeah. 20, 30, 80 doesn't make a difference. And you said something for a second. You said, uh, you know, she's had a hard time finding her purpose. You don't find your purpose. Right. And this is something that's really important to understand. You commit to your purpose. There's, there's a very different word hmm. because finding your purpose means that your purpose exists and you just, you're going to find it right. by, by looking for it. And that's why a lot of people never actually, you know, acknowledge any type of purpose. Right. So ultimately the best thing is to learn how to be purposeful to commit uh, to uh, a perp or something that you believe to be greater than yourself, which becomes your life purpose. And I think people misunderstand. Like purpose is nothing more than than who you are in this moment and, and why you exist in this time and space. And I know it sounds a lot more complicated than this when you think about it, because you're like, it's got to be this grand opening, like I said, where this is what I'm going to do for the next 50 years. But even if you're a cashier in a store, you can be of purpose, and that's what you need to understand, that your purpose at that moment is to back groceries or to ring up groceries and to commit to that trade, even if you don't like it, right? Because you've committed to the job, so you have to commit to the purpose that you've undertaken in that job at that moment, even if you don't like it. By learning to commit to your existence at that moment in time and space, instead of seeking the next realm to your existence at that moment, you're able to then commit to a greater cause once you actually identify one you can relate to. 
So I think when people aren't willing to do that, they often seek uh, like a magical purpose in essence, one that is more, of, you know, like it's going to appear and be very powerful and right. life changing. They don't realize that they adopt kind of this idea of being purposeful for the moment. And that purpose in itself evolves, enabling confidence and things like that to trigger in your mind to feel like you can undertake bigger change. You know, hmm. I'm sure that even a Musk didn't have the opportunity very early in his earlier age to say, I'm going to send people to Mars and all I have to do is build a rocket. You know, but over time, as he kind of explored and grew in the business world and understood how dots connected, that ability to connect his engineering level, his business acumen to the idea of sending people to Mars became a, a purpose he could commit to at that time. Right. See, that that's a really good point because that's a really good way to put it. So basically what you're saying is you can find purpose – in your daily actions, you can have purposeful action or whatever. It doesn't have to be something spectacular, something mystical, something you can just take where you're at right now and, and make that purposeful. And through doing that, you'll slowly unlock the purpose, the keys that will eventually unlock your whole purpose. All right. I mean, everybody has a purpose at any given time, like, and they, they just need to commit to that. And that's the problem. Like no matter what you do, I don't care you're a cashier, you're a car wash person or anything else. The the art the art of, of just accepting purpose is to ultimately accept the trade you've been given to do at that moment. Not to think I'm gonna be a cashier for life, so therefore, you know, like I need to be great at this right, right now. But to be able to be great at something knowing that you're not going to be doing this forever is a much harder task. I mean, how many people have a job and they say, well, because I hate this job, who cares? I'm never going to get promoted anyways. I don't want to be here in five years, so I'm just not going to do a good job. But when you think about the person is still at work at that moment, they're still at work for that hour. Even if, they, even if we all agree that this person will not work at that supermarket in the next 10 years, that's a fair argument. But the person is at the supermarket at that moment, they're going to be at that supermarket in three hours by the time their shift ends. How they use those three hours in between when they're at work is their choice. They can be unengaged and just worried and dreaming about the future and their next job that doesn't exist, or they can do an incredible job in the purpose they've committed to at that very moment at that supermarket. And this builds character. And over time, character enables individuals to, to have that character carry over to their next job. So one day when they do find the job where they feel like their work matters, maybe they're working at a hospital and they're saving people and they really are in tune with their work and connected to it and do believe they'll do it for the next 20, 30 years, they'll already have built the character to be in a position uh, to actually not only find purpose but be great at what they do. And that greatness will, again, reinforce this idea that this could be perhaps what you're willing to commit to for the next 20, 30 years. Hmm. So everyone has the opportunity to kind of live and find their purpose. There's no exception. There's no excuse. 100%. Because not everybody has the, has the potential. They have the potential to, to find purpose in what they do. Hmm. And they have an obligation to commit their life to something. Because they're going to anyways, that they like it or not. So the point becomes what they commit mm -hmm. to can be a choice of theirs or it can be given to them by circumstance, which means they'll never graduate the first circle. Yep. And there, there's proof in this in, somebody, in someone that a lot of people know well, which is Grant Cardone, because he talks a lot about this. And when he started, the, the last job he did was he was working at a dealership. He was doing sales. That his uncle got him a job that he didn't want. And he was doing that. He was showing up every day. He hated it. He didn't want it. He was complaining. He said, I'm not going to sell cars. I didn't go to school to sell cars. And eventually he realized that that was getting him nowhere. And he just said, hey, I'm not going to move on to anything else until I come in and be the best car salesperson I can be for myself to prove that I can, I can fulfill this role to the best of my ability. And he showed up different. He showed up with that attitude. He, he made it his purpose just to be the best possible salesperson in his whatever state or in, even in just that dealership. And that's when he said was that defining moment when you go, shit, I can actually take responsibility, commit to things and actually do them well. And that's where everything started to kind of chain for him. So I think that's a turning point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Crazy, man. So let's, let, let's bring it back to your, I kind of skipped way ahead of this because I got too excited talking to you, <laughs> but a lot of people are listening to this going, 
hey, that's great. You're super successful. You're wearing what's on your wrist there? Panerai. What's that? Oh, this is one of my favorite watches. It's a Panerai. Uh, it's a rose gold blue dial 277. Oh my I god! I actually looked for this watch for like two years. I couldn't find one. And so. what's that? Like forty grand? No, they're like thirty six grand. And using watch conspiracy, you can buy one if you can find one for like twenty ish. You know, which is. Cool wow. So, okay. We got to talk about those businesses but before I do that. So don't forget again, a lot of people are listening to this going, Hey, you're super successful. You're wearing these watches. You got these cars. You got these businesses. You're helping tens and tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands, whatever it is now. Um, and they said, that's great. You can talk about purpose and about happiness, but what they don't know is where you started. So I want to talk about how did this all start? You didn't just fall into a wealthy family of entrepreneurship. Did you? No, I actually, uh, I was, I grew up very poor. Uh, when I said poor, meaning we, we had shelter and food. That was it, you know, wow. and shelter was limited to other people's shelter a lot of times. Wow. And there's nothing wrong with that. I had a single mom that uh, I still do, you know, that I love very much that did whatever she had to to get me out of Iran. It was just a bad era for that, uh, just to, to have a life there. And so she sacrificed a lot of her personal uh, businesses, well-being and everything just to get me out to eventually end up in France and then from France to uh, finally, after 11 years to the United States, first in LA, then Virginia, and then finally in Florida. And it wasn't until we really got to Virginia that I had a chance to really start establishing myself because I was just a child, you know, traveling around with wherever my mom went, I had to go, you know, it wasn't really a, a choice. And so, you know, just moved country to country until we kind of made it to Virginia, at which point, uh, no green card, you know, no ability to uh, work or do anything. Learned uh, how to wash cars very early, kind of made that a, a, a little bit of a side hustle early on when I didn't even have a job. You know, so then I started. This was at 14. I started working uh, eventually by kind of scamming a remodeling company into hiring me without a green card. Them not knowing what they were doing. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, and it's funny because to this day sometimes I wonder. I'm like, is one of them watching this? Like, what the fuck? I hired this kid, and like, yeah, I didn't know this. You know. So, but you know, like that worked and I did really well in telemarketing at a young age and then I became a very young bank manager. Uh, I was about 18, almost going to 19 and then worked my way in banking till I was about 25. Uh, and then when I got fired from banking, I kind of, uh, focused on this side business that I kind of built, which was car wash business and ultimately evolved that from a car wash to a tuning shop, to a brokerage firm, to an investment firm on alternative assets and that gave me a lot of capital a lot of growth that along with some really good uh real estate dealings pre-recession hmm. pre-great recession enabled me to have enough capital to feel comfortable uh kind of abandoning a very successful business and focusing on building an online uh kind of uh, an online education based platform called secret answers at the time uh and while i had my other businesses kind of running in the background and that enabled me to then start another like a bunch of platforms like Exotic Car Hacks, Watch Conspiracy, and now kind of live in both the investment space, which I still own VIP Motoring, and then also own all of these online platforms. Uh, that they're not passive in nature, but they're very uh, they're very good for me because I love uh, teaching, and this has enabled me to teach to way more people than I could have not having these online platforms. So. It's ultimately enabled me to commit to my purpose myself, which has always been teaching, uh, and now has been a enabled me to just get really good at it because I can do so much of it on a day in day, day out basis. Wow, that so so you lived literally the path, like you went through the whole concept of thirds. Like you didn't start your first job, you weren't passionate about it. Like you found no, passion I, in it, dude. I hated it. I right. mean, no joke, man. My first my first job was telemarketing, and yeah. who likes being a telemarketer? My first client's name was Mr. Black Dick. No joke. I called him <laughs> like Mr. Black Dick home, and I get hanged up on it. And I'm like, Mr. Dick Black, maybe? I said, that, you know, is there a Black Dick home? You know, so I was like, okay. So it's like messed up. But it's true. You know, I'm like, okay. So these, and the guys in the office were playing a joke on me, and I'm like, this 14-year-old that doesn't even speak like, good English, you know, and I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, Mr. Black Dick. <laughs> People look at me, and they're like, Wow, what an idiot, you know? <laughs> What's fun is I hated my job, but I didn't have a choice, and I didn't nag about it, meaning I didn't like it, but mm -hmm. what it was was it was a job, and I couldn't find another one because if I lost that one, it would be hard to get one without a green card. So 
What I did is I suck it up. And the best part about it was that everybody in the office was like, who cares? It's a telemarketing job. Yeah. You're not going to do that shit forever. And I was like, you're right. But since I'm here four hours a day, every day after school, I might as well get really good at it because those guys next door are selling roofing and siding and they're making commissions of like 10 grand in a job. And I'm selling uh, their leads. And I could, if they were selling my leads, I could be making two to 3,000 instead of mm. just sitting here pretending to make calls. So yeah. either I'm going to go home with $10 an hour or I'm going to go home with $2,000 commissions. So I said, let me actually go and ask the sales guys, how do you sell? What do you do? Who do you call? Who are your clients? So I started learning from the sales guys when everybody else was fucking around in the office. And I did it because I figured if I'm going to spend four hours there, why not optimize that time and try to make the most of it? And that's how I took my regular job from like $200 checks to $2,500 checks a week, you hmm. know? And when you're 15 years old and you're doing that kind of dollar, you don't know what to do with it. First off, you've never even seen it. Your mom wasn't even doing it. So you're like sitting there like, okay, I have all this money. So the first thing you do is you buy a shit ton of video games and you still have money left over. And then you don't know what to do with it. So, <laughs> so you start figuring out new ways to put it away. And then I started realizing that maybe I needed to help my mom more and really be the central focus of growing, you know, our family because it was just me and my mom. Wow. Wow. See that, that, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's the attitude more people need to take both with their work and, and like also you did find a passion and purpose out of it, which you just said, which was supporting your mom and building your family. Like that's a deep, purpose and meaning for you right and well, that it was it, you know, it was for that moment it was meaning right yeah. it was purpose and it was meaning but 90 percent of life and success isn't knowledge isn't who you know what you know it's perspective right you know like I, I, i'll give you a really good example of perspective which i shared with a bunch of people recently and it really hit home for them someone i always post things on instagram about you don't need a degree to be successful you know my lambo says no degree on it yeah. and i've always done posts about like oh you know you don't need an education to be successful and blah 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 and i get a lot of feedback on that people are like well it's bullshit you need a degree if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer <laughs> haha you know and i'm like are you a doctor or a lawyer no but somehow <laughs> you want to argue now for the doctor association of the world it's okay that wasn't the point but I was, I made a point to one of my friends years ago that you don't have to actually be a doctor to, to practice medicine. And he completely was like, well, you're full of shit. You need a PhD and then you need a doctorate to practice medicine. And I said, no, and I'm going to prove it to you. And when I was in real estate, what I did is I bought a commercial building and I hired five doctors straight out of school who were too retarded to know how to run a business. <laughs> I built a lab in the building and put the five doctors in there. Next thing you know, boom. Yeah, boom. Now I had five doctors that worked for me. I had a free lab. I had free health care and I had everything I wanted. Plus, I was getting a cut out of all five doctors. I was getting a cut of all their labs and I was making money on the building. So then I was like, why would you want to be a doctor? You know, when you can do what I do, then why would I want to go and go 20 years in school only to do what one of these guys can do yeah. when I can do what all five can do and make them do it for me for free yeah. while they pay me to do it. Like this doesn't make, this is no brainer. And so people were like, this doesn't make any sense. And I was like, no, what doesn't make sense is that people look at life through a perspective of one to one. Yeah. I want something. There's only one path to get yeah. it. It's a straightforward, like I either like people are like, I want to start a business. So I need money. Well, I need $10,000. I need this. I need that. So I'm going to go there and I need a loan and this is what I need. Or, or they're like, you know what? It can't happen. Nope. Sorry. It's not there. So I'm not meant to have a business. And then I'm like, well, why don't you get a job? Well, because that's going to take two years to save up. And I'm like, okay, well, it's better to start in two years than to never start at all. Right. It's better to work towards the goal and know that two years later you look back and you're like, that was interesting. I still have 10 grand now. I'm ready to go. Rather than say, well, I'm going to look at it. I don't have 10 grand. I don't know where to start. Okay, I'm done. Have a good day. Like, I'm just going to go and hold my dick in a corner of the room and do nothing. You know? <laughs> See, I, I think th like this is my humble take on a lot of this, which is why people don't do these things is I think there's a big part of our society that – we don't find our purpose. That's just the way it is. We don't really, most people don't develop any sort of mission or, or purpose or meaning. They just kind of live. And the reason why that's possible now, I think as well, is because of the amount of distraction. Because I can say, hey, instead of facing these problems, these pains, this uncertainty, this anxiety or depression, I can just binge watch Netflix. I can go party. I can get drunk every Friday. They're, they're filling that. So they never really think about it. Like I know people who have had the same job for the last like 
18 years making minimum wage that still do the exact same thing that literally just come home at, at 4.30, 5 o'clock, turn on Netflix, watch until 9.30, 10 p.m., pass out, so literally four, five, six hours, repeat, do it all again, weekend comes, they go out, they drink all day, they spend their whole paycheck doing it, and you're trying to figure out why would someone do that. To me, it just seems like, well, they know there's a, there's a deep hole in them, they know something's missing, but instead of thinking that way and saying, you know, how can I start pushing towards something? What's the thing I really want? How can I work hard and take time and invest you know, my, my hours and my money and whatever and get like, that's too complicated when Netflix can just be turned well, it's on. Not right? complica- it, it's not complicated. It just requires the ability to see five years ahead. And it's not that you know, look, it's the same idea why people don't start businesses. Like the idea of starting a business isn't sexy, right? It's like, are you willing to work like a slave for 10 years in hopes that maybe you'll be part of the 0.2% that succeeds in business mm-hmm. and actually is able to make an income of this? Or do you wanna go collect $500 a week working at the supermarket and you're guaranteed to feed your family, you're, you know, have this money to maybe go out and spend the weekends? And so right. first it becomes this, well, the other angle is too risky for me, right? And I don't have enough confidence in myself to make it true, so I'm just not gonna start at all. Then the other angle starts becoming that you then justify you can't afford to do it because you have a family, you have, you know, obligations. So you create a hole that makes it comfortable for you to justify as an excuse why you don't need to get out of. And it's, listen, it's okay. People, uh, I always say people need to realize that uh, not everyone has the courage. It takes courage to be an entrepreneur. It takes courage to be a business owner. Not everybody has the courage. Not everybody has the self-discipline. Not everybody has the self-love and self-opportunity to to believe in themselves enough to be willing to try something. And then also don't forget that misery loves company. And often the people we circle ourselves with when we're in these miserable spaces, well, they're obviously not astronauts and Olympians and (laughs) top of the line business owners. They're just morons that are going to the bar with us that are justifying their failure. Because some guy cut them off, and that's the story of their day. They're like, oh, I'm going to talk about this guy that cut me off on the interstate for four hours while we drink a beer. And somehow there is a lot of value in that in my life. And the other guy is like, yeah, let me share my story of how this other lady cut me off. And then next thing you know, you spend five hours of worthless living, and like you literally could go die, and nobody would remember or care. And and that I know it's very brutal, right? I'm, yeah, I'm very it's, it's 100% true. But, but it's, it's true, right? Like yeah. a lot of these guys don't realize that – they could get hit by a car and yes. nobody would care. Yeah. Like 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 their families would be more concerned about the fact that they don't have five hundred dollars coming in that the dude's dead. <laughs> like I mean that's pretty fucked up. You know, like yeah. and when when you don't let that sink in, it's because you're afraid that if you do let it sink in, then you have to know that you have to change. Right. 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 Nobody likes that, you know. Right. So if you let it sink in that you could be a diabetic because you're that close, then you have to change, right? Yeah. But if you ignore it, then you're like, well, I'll only deal with it when it happens. Yeah. Then it's usually too late. You let the destruction happen first, and then you're like, oh, well, you know, like that wasn't my fault. There's bad content in this food. And it's like no one told your ass to eat seven pieces of cake today. You know, like you chose to eat seven pieces of cake like fine the cake's fucked up but not seven pieces of it you know one piece was fucked enough you didn't need to eat seven and that's the thing yeah no and and that and that's so true and i think we're coming to that point though in in society in general where we have that entitlement i I, wasn't there a a lady suing mcdonald's for making her obese i'm pretty sure that was a thing (laughs) like we're getting someone to do a penguin in the arctic for being a penguin they would fucking figure out a way to sue him for global warming (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> See, this actually, who, I think it was on Joe Rogan's podcast. He was just, he was talking to, I can't remember, some big tech executive, some billionaire, uh, some huge company. He was, he was saying the HR at the level of those companies is so crazy because the shit people come up with. He said he had an employee that was suing the company because that employee identified as a furry and thought he was a cat and they wouldn't put a litter box in the bathroom of this multi-billion dollar company and he's suing the company and he's probably going to win. That's the sad Bro, part. I, if, I had a, if I had an employee like that, first off, I'd take him out back and congratulate them on being a furry. I would videotape their shit out of them and then I'd just be like, all right. So yeah, complain one time and that shit goes viral. <laughs> Here's your litter box. 
<laughs> hey, they, they, they probably like it. But see, that's the thing. I mean, we're, we're getting to a weird place, but I don't want to even get there because it's a whole rabbit hole. But you, you're right on all this stuff. I mean, I, I see it. It's, it's also why I don't hang out with a lot of my high school friends because I'm tired of going out with people that when you talk to them, it's here's what my boss did. Here's what's shitty about my job. Here's what stre- – like – and then they ask you what you do, and then you feel like shit telling them because they're just like, oh, yeah, good for you. Like, back to my problems, right? Like, they don't, don't want to hear it. But, but, you know, I mean, look, look, argue with these people, the people that argue that they don't love their job. Okay, then change it. Like, if you, you know, so many people, yeah. they, like, they're always looking at me, and they're like, oh, my God, I hate working. And I'm like, okay, well, do you have a new job? How many, how many applications you filled out this week for a new location? They're like, oh, none. How many times in the last six months you apply for a new job or converse with your boss about ways to improve things in the workplace? None. Okay, well, if you don't want to do anything, well, why complain about it? Like, if you're, if you're not going to do anything anyways, then the outcome's not going to change anyways, so why even bitch about this even happening? So leave it alone. Like, let it happen. You know what I mean? Like, let it just yep. stop. Like, do your job and go home and find your happiness by hanging out with your kids, not with your job. If you're not going to do anything, then... Stop being miserable at the same job. There you go. That's it. Life advice right there. So, hey, let, let's bring that forward a little bit because, I mean, that, that's kind of where we came through. You had all this, this success. I mean, you, well, you started with no success, built all this success, made some money, and now you have some really cool businesses, products that I kind of want to touch on because I like them all. Um, one of them we mentioned is Secret Entourage, which you guys do a, a ton of stuff. You have academies. You have events. You have all kind of masterminds, I think, too, right? Mm-hmm. So you have all that stuff, but then you have these two other very interesting – it seems pretty simple from the outside, but very interesting, which is you have watch conspiracy, which is basically how people are getting these crazy watches like the one you're wearing right now um, that are $36,000 for $20,000. And then you have one for exotic car hacks, which to my understanding is how to get a car and either make the money, like buy some sort of Ferrari or Lamborghini and make money on it, not lose a couple years down the road, or at least break even or lose very little. We're only losing maybe a couple hundred mm-hmm. bucks and you're driving for free. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, I spent the, a large portion of my life building my company, VIP Motoring, which was uh, literally an investment company focused on alternative assets like cars, art, and watches, and uh, of course, any precious metals and so on and so forth. And so I spent uh, about eight years of my life really in that business, uh, like helping people. And I had another 10 years before that an experience in banking, which have leveraged when it comes to finance, lending, investing, and everything else. So I combined alternative assets like uh, luxury goods with my banking background and created that firm. Now, fast forward later, after I got really good at teaching with Secret Entourage and understanding the online teaching model, I decided that while we focused more on exclusive million dollar plus cars, because those were really the core investments uh, at VIP Motoring, we also uh, decided that I had also decided that at some point, there were people that would buy normal exotics like Ferrari 458s, 488s, Gallardos, Huracans and stuff and wanted to drive them, you know, and there was a financial model to these two. It wasn't as solid of an investment as obviously a million dollar car, et cetera, but it, there was an opportunity to be able to drive these cars for a year, year and a half at a time uh, and put some miles on them, like three to 4,000 miles and get out at the same ownership dollar that you put in. So it ultimately gave birth to this strategy that I started teaching online called the wealth transfer strategy, which was how do you stop spending money and instead transfer money into assets temporarily? So it's like if you have 200 grand in your savings account, as an example, you could take 40,000 of it and move it into a Lamborghini, drive that car for 12 months, and then take that money back out of that car without really diminishing its value, putting it back in your savings or moving it to another car or watches or anything else. So this, if, if you go on vacation and you spend 10 grand, the money's gone. You yeah. pay for your flights. The moment you get off that flight, the money's gone, right? Like you get on the hotel, you're done, the money's gone. But when you buy a Lamborghini or you buy a Ferrari, if you buy the right one, not to confuse people, um, cars are still depreciating liabilities except for uh, some cars. And so once you know what to buy, how to buy it, and at what price to pay for it, then you're buying uh, uh, like an equity position in the car, meaning what you're buying is you're buying the margin of the car, you know, right. the, the, the difference between its bottom value and the dollar that a dealer tries to get for it. And so you can either consume that margin and drive it for that margin and then get rid of it for what you pay, or you can go ahead and actually sell it instantly and make money like a dealer. But I don't teach people how to be dealers, so that's not really 
the point of that. So the point is to consume the margin that the dealer would have made on the deal. Right. And so I teach that in the car space and then on the watch side, watches are just an incredible investment. I mean, even Kevin O'Leary recently on the guy from Shark Tank on that. CNBC said that the last four years is best asset class investment was watches. Watches are just an incredible opportunity for people to invest or to flip uh, and trade in order to make a buck. I mean, I average 15% return in three days on my money in watches, which is absurd. You know, wow. like it's insane if you consider what I know about banking. That's like nuts. Yeah. You know, most people, if you told someone 10 years ago you make 15% in three days, they tell you you're a scam artist. <laughs> you're going to end up in American greed in five years. You know, what yeah, are you yeah. doing? What scheme you're running? And it's like, I'm not using other people's money. It's my own money. So the point is that, you know, doing that it has become such a powerful tool that I've started teaching uh, at Watch Conspiracy, regular people, how they can become watch traders. And we have the world's only watch trading academy. Uh, it's very powerful. I mean, we have a few students now that over the last year and in 18 crossed over 150,000 in profit in one year. And this is just from home, you know, doing this part time. So I find that to be such a opportunity if they can do it. One of them's like 18 years old. So, wow. if, you know, if he can do it, then anybody can do it. You know, he, he's also not loaded, didn't come with a hundred grand to the table. All of them start with a thousand dollars, you know, and that wow. should tell you anybody can play. No way. Okay. So I got to definitely get in on those two courses. <laughs> I don't know why I haven't already, but I want to get in on both of those for sure, because this is two, I mentioned before, two passion areas of mine at least from the passion for them is the cars. I've always like, I grew up, my dad was an automotive. Um, he was a GM in a dealership and he did what you just mentioned with the cars, but because he could buy things at like what, like they'd get a trade in of something and he'd mm -hmm. buy it at a trade in value. There's no markup. And he'd drive that for two, three years. And I remember he'd sell it and he'd make his five, six, seven grand on it and he'd get another one. But I never realized how could you do that without being in the dealership. But obviously you have strategies. Yeah, I mean, I teach people how to do everything they can do without having a dealer's license, without needing to go to auctions. People usually think that I'm teaching people how to buy at auctions, etc. Mm. And I usually teach against that. So most people, I teach them how to use any dealer across the U.S. to leverage these strategies to get wow. uh, what you need out of it. Is is this feasible in Canada? Do you think? We have a lot of members in Canada, actually. They use it a lot in Canada. Uh, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one science, meaning it's not exactly the same, uh, mainly because laws around lending are different in Canada. Yeah. But you guys still have strong lending compared to like Australia or the UK, et cetera. So right. you're still in a better position. But there isn't enough supply in the Canadian market to justify the price fluctuation that the U.S. has right. uh, and the margins the U.S. has. However... There are hundred different ways you can apply the strategies I teach to learn the market in Canada and then run this in Canada the exact same mm. way. If that makes sense, oh, yeah, 100%. But you have does. To give it some thought. You can't yes. just be like, you know, PJ said, buy this car, and I'm just going to go buy this car. You know? Yes, yes, no, hundred percent. Like, like the, the fundamental principles can be applied and tweaked. Hundred percent. But, but the, yeah, and it right. can work very successfully. But like, if you go to my car list, maybe some of those cars aren't as you know, wanted in Canada or don't have as much supply of in Canada. So when you're looking at my car list and then you look at the the dollar, you know, and you're like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. You know, like cars in Canada are like 50 grand more. I don't understand where he's getting these numbers from. So that part may be different. But, it, you know, the context is the same because if you if I tell you you spend 150 and you get 150 back out, then you didn't spend any money. Right. So if you buy the same item in Canada for 180 and the Canadian market allows it to stay at 180, then that's the same concept. It just costs you 30K more to play in the game, but it didn't actually require, you know what I mean? Like it, it didn't really change the dynamic of the game. Right. The outcome is the same. That's interesting. So I'm going to kind of use this last little bit here to kind of, let's assume I'm getting into this because I, I, I want to. So I want your take on if I'm getting to exotic car, which, which is the plan, because right now I did something you're going to hate me for. And I'm debating telling you, but basically... You've leased a Tesla. <laughs> Close. Um, no, you I... You did the worst of the world. You leased I, a vacuum cleaner and now you regret it. No, I bought a Dyson and I drive it to work. No, yeah, um, I <laughs> no, I leased on my... I could have bought, it didn't matter. But on my accountant's recommendation, I leased a Mercedes. And you're going to tell me it's a fake AMG, but it's a C43 AMG because that's... Obviously, I want to spend as little as possible, but look clean showing up to meetings and doing what we do. 
Um, and that's obviously, a, in a way, a dumb financial decision. It's not going to make me any money. It's going to lose a percentage a bit every year minus the write-offs. Um, but whatever. It's a clean card. I want to get out of that soon, probably the next year or, or two. Mm-hmm. And I want to get into something else. Now, should I be looking towards, like, one of my dream cards was one of the ones that you have. Actually, tell me the cards you have now so everyone can hear. I have my Performante Spider. Uh, I have a 600 LT coming in three weeks. Nice. Uh, I have a GT3 RS. Oh an SLS AMG, uh, <laughs> just got rid of my Ventador S, uh, the F12 Ferrari, oh my God. the uh, the G-Wagon, and the M5. Wow. So for non-car people, that's just millions of dollars in cars, basically. Wow. Okay. So it, just, <laughs> it doesn't have to cost millions of dollars. No, no, no. You know? But it is. It is, it, it is worth that, right? So, which, which is great. So you have that. So I want to get into this. Should I be looking towards, like, I love that, the Performante. That's one of my dream cars. Should I be trying to, like, can you exotic car hacks that? Or is there certain models of Lamborghinis I should be looking for? Do I go older? Like, no, I mean, where do I start? Can. I, this is my, this is my second Performante. My first one, I drove for seven and a half months. Uh, and it was a coupe. It was an 18 coupe. And I bought it for three, 17 and I sold it for 314. Wow. So I drove a, a three hundred fifty thousand dollar like Lamborghini for three thousand dollars for seven months, and I put more miles on it than your lease allows for thirty six months. Yeah, yeah. Oh I drove the shit out of it everywhere. I didn't care. Like, that's crazy. See, so so a guy like me, I'm starting. I don't want to buy my first exotic. What's what's your number one tip? Do I go with the very basic stuff? Do we find that older Audi R8, no, or do I go right no, to the passion no, no. project? Buying buying my into my system comes in two basic, very easy steps. It's the cars and the ability to buy the cars. That's mm. where people get confused. So everybody thinks you have to buy these cars cash. Mm. So maybe you can, and that's more power to you. You know, if you if you're me and you have enough money to buy these cash sometimes and you want to finance some, that's fantastic. That's the best way to go about it. But if you don't have 200 grand sitting in an account or 300 grand sitting in an account, then you typically will use my strategies to get loans. And I teach people how to leverage that to banks to get banks to lend you on exotics because banks actually like exotics more than they like, uh, like normal cars. So what happens is there are strategies to getting exotic car loans and you can stretch them a little bit longer so your payments aren't that ridiculously high like a normal conventional loan. In addition to that, you can also leverage my strategies to get interest rates you've never heard of that are extremely low and you can also leverage that to go to very small down payment models where you're not giving away your cash. It depends on how your personal situation is. So I usually tell people the better hacker you become is the better you become at leveraging your personal ability to buy even if it's growing your credit growing your exotic car credit that there's a, such a thing as that so what i'm saying is like you actually either get in a really good position to buy and then it's also about what you buy so once the two come together that's when you start getting perfect hacks where you have the ability to buy you're getting the right cars at the right dollar and then the two go in hand to hand but if you've never bought a car and you suddenly say i want a 150k car and i want to put a you know, I don't care what it costs. Well, then the issues become that the loan cost could be significantly higher right. than what you can, you know, make up on the car because you're getting a 10% and <laughs> you don't know what you're doing, etc. So conventional ways to look at this makes it very expensive. Uh, real, you know, perspective on how to make this work for you makes it, you know, doable once you understand that you are the buyer and you are half the equation as much as the car itself, you know. Got it. So I got to take the course and I'll figure it out. Where can I find it? Uh, ExoticCarHacks.com for the cars. WatchConspiracy.com for uh, the watches. SecretEntourage.com for the business, which you're already part of. Yep. Beautiful. And for the watches, that's one more thing I want to ask you. This this one's totally for me. I haven't bought any proper watches ever. I've only bought the the, the fashion crap, right? Mm-hmm. Starting out, what's one of the best brands? That, let's say I have to have a $10,000 budget. What's one of the best brands I can start getting into to start flipping? Uh, it depends what your goal is. If your goal is to have a nice watch on, you can buy some really nice Panerai's and very basic APs for 10, 11 grand. Mm-hmm. Uh, if your goal is to kind of show off, you know, like, like meaning have like a status watch, mm. then they, there's just a lot of uh, quality like twenty, twenty two thousand dollar Panerai's you can buy for like eight, nine grand, and there's a lot of nice really? Rolexes you can have for like ten grand. You know, it it, it all depends. I mean, it, it's really more about the deal than the watch. So I can't mm. say that. 
like what I'm wearing now is not popular to the masses. You know, yeah. it's popular to the enthusiasts, like yeah. really more to the Panerai community than it is to the overall watch guys. You know, some right. guys will be, unless it's Patek, AP, or Rolex, I'm not, you're not cool enough for me. I have plenty of all of them, but the point is that it's like, as you get bigger at this, you start gaining a niche for what you love and what you wear, you know, what works for you. Yeah. Uh, and, and when you have more than one watch, you don't have to be picky about what to do. But usually I tell people if you're going to buy one cool uh, conversation piece mm-hmm. slash value watch, usually a Panerai or a base models, you know, Rolex will hold its value forever. You know, you're fine. Nice. Beautiful. Well, that, that's enough for me. I'll get both courses. I'll hop in them. I will learn and I will see if I can be a case study because we got some comments coming in on Facebook right now uh, from some of it looks like your customers. So one said he bought his car using exotic car hacks and he's in Canada. So confirm that it does work, which is good. Very cool. So I appreciate all that, man. I really appreciate the time. We're coming up on, on just over an hour here. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you're busy, but thank you so much for coming on. It really did mean a lot. And hopefully we can have you on uh, again in the future. You got it, buddy. Keep doing what you're doing, okay? And congrats on your success so far. Awesome. I'm thank sure you. you'll keep going. Thank take you care. so much. You've been listening to the Obscurity to Authority podcast. Tune in again next week with your host, Darren Cabral, as he explores the blueprint of success.